And here we are, better late than never. Welcome Indeed. to Mentis Live, episode 57. I'm Tristan Jutra. I'm William Sower. And me, I'm Teja Custody. Nailed it! <laughs> Except for the one person who's missing, hopefully who will be here soon. Um, it's great, though, being able to introduce ourselves without having to describe where in space we are for those who may be listening audio only eventually. So good job, team. We did it. All right. This pace and awkward silences reminds me of The Problem with Jon Stewart, his latest series on Apple TV Plus, oh. because it's an hour long. Yeah, and it's filled with awkward silences. I and, never watched and, it. And, and slow jokes, and it's like it's yeah. unlike the twenty-two minute oh. nice and tight Daily Show that it was on. It's like, I mean, there's some good stuff in there, but it's just like it's really part. It's really painful to watch. Oh, okay. no. Anyhow, we're not talking about John Stewart today. What are we going to talk about today? Well, all sorts of stuff. But let's start with some follow up, shall we? Yes. Last week, it was just Will and me, the stalwart William Silver. Yeah. Tasia, we're happy to have you back. Y'all, Thank you. Y- you had your little. What was it last week? I mean, it seems. Are you? Are you? Do you remember? I don't even remember. <laughs> it was something. <laughs> to be oh, because you, you. you just made it up. All right. So. No. <laughs> She's playing hooky. Yeah, that's fine. No. Uh, that's fine. So w- last week, Will and I talked about this uh, fantastic watch that was. What was it? Four hundred thousand dollars or something? Yeah. Will and it came with an NFT. Yeah. But um, this was just. And there it is. Look, it's got a. Q- Robot Barf QR code on there, so you can scan it and it. access your uh, Q- your your uh, QR code, or so you could access your NFT. But it was needed its own way. It's just super thin, one of the thinnest watches in the world. Super but expensive. But what time is it? It doesn't matter. Uh, you, just, <laughs> you know, it's not you can use it to tell time. You look at your phone for that, right? But this just was em- it's emblematic of some of the interesting things that are happening in the watch world right now. We just thought we'd do a quick follow up on this because so many people ha- are going with Apple Watches nowadays. Apple Watch, which you know debuted in 2015, a lot of people called it a failure at the time, because, you know, because within a couple of years it was it only sold 25 million units, and they're adding about 25 million new users per year at this point. So a no, huge flop, right, guys? So lots of folks are wearing Apple Watches, and if not Apple Watches, Fitbits, Garmin's, and other fitness trackers and smartwatches. So of course, the traditional watch industry has had to reinvent itself. So this recent article from uh, Wired was telling us about Geneva's Watches and Wonders Fair, which is basically the consumer electronics show, or CES, of the watch world. And it featured none other than the one one watch that Will and I talked about last week, the... um, uh, the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Ultra. I don't even think we talked about its name last no, week. No, I don't think we did. I Actually, I would have recognized the name because mm-hmm. Bulgari is a very right. expensive watch. Exactly. So that was the one that was $440,000 US, which is 1.8 millimeters thick. But a few others uh, worth uh, mentioning here. The H. Moser Streamlizer, Streamliner Blacker Than Black. Now, this is just a concept because it is treated and or painted with Vanta Black, which is the blackest... Oh color, the black, blackest paint color uh, available on the planet at the moment. And so, there is, uh, where did the video go? There was so a video sorry, just a sec. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. Vanta Black. Vanta, not Vanta to Black. Be, mm-hmm. Vanta Black, not to be confused with Black Manta, who is Aquaman's chief villain. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I add the nerd. What yeah, can I say? Exactly. Well done. And, but, but just look at this. So when you put it in front of a Vanta Black painted background, and the watch itself is painted Vanta Black, you literally cannot see the details of the watch, except for in this case, the hands, which are white and uh, red. I think the, the second hand is red. Wow. Uh, yeah, so look at that. Call the so Navy black. SEALs. What, why else would you need that? Right. right. And so there have been people that have, uh, that have been painting um, cars Vanta Black uh, as well, and they look interesting. The only problem with Vanta Black is that it's super delicate, so you could not actually wear, in its current form, a Vanta Black painted watch. So just, there you, just so you know, what, what is now? I've heard of Vanta Black. Mm-hmm. Refresh my memory. Like, it, what, well, why it's is made, it so crazy? What it, because what it's made it with carbon nanotubes, and. Somehow, just the way that they refract the light or not, they just absorb all the light. 
like this is basically like having a black hole on your wrist or on your car or whatever you paint it. Super, super expensive uh, coating at the moment, but it's it's more for lab applications currently than than commercial applications. I think you can buy, but it's super expensive. But it just makes everything look like a featureless black void. So that'd be great for a Halloween costume, quite honestly. Just anyway. Wonder if it rubs off on the skin. Uh, well, it, quite possibly because it's like I said, it's super delicate and can rub off yeah. on pretty much anything. One of the other watches featured the show is the first watch made with lab-grown diamonds. Mm. So that is an area that's been developing over the last decade or so, or lab grown diamonds you know made under ex extreme uh, heat and pressure you know maybe to help us get away from some of the problematic elements of the diamond industry uh tag heuer carrera plasma which is uh you know which, which is is what that this is called we also have a 3d printed squishy gold cushion um so yeah and what do you guys think of the look of this? Does anybody's guess what time it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. it's just like, you just take a look and go, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> Looks like over the ear headphones in, in a way, yeah. except they yeah. wouldn't be very comfortable just with all those uh, those jewels. So that's the Cartier Cousin de Cartier. So, which basically, uh, you know, it's cushion. Um, a Stormtrooper metaverse watch, because, you know, everything's got to be metaverse. And I'm not sure which makes this Stormtrooper, except for the fact that it's yeah. black and it's white. Yeah. Um, Top Gun Lake, Lake Tahoe, uh, Ro uh, Rolex reversed. You know, Whoa, you know the thing about tricky. stormtroopers is mm -hmm. that unless it's clearly a stormtrooper from Star Wars, I don't think you want to call something the stormtrooper watch. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> with all black with some lightning bolts on it. Yeah, exactly, and an eagle. <laughs> so the Rolex, uh, re but reverse. Do you see, so Will, do do you notice what's the deal here? I think I think Tasia caught it right away. Yeah. What's reversed like, about this? I don't know. Look what side the uh, the uh, what you call it is on the um, crown. Yeah, the crown's on the wrong side, and then the numbers are. No, numbers are fine. Oh yeah, the date. Yeah, the date numbers yeah, are on yeah. the left side as well. But the crown. So yeah. this is something. Left handed. Um, how many decades did it take for Rolex to create a oh, high end watch for left handed people so that they could adjust the uh, the time in other be. settings? So that's kind of cool. I could see people buying that just for a, you know it's uh, it's rarity. Left handed GMT Master Two. Uh, you know that's only ten grand US. An orbital mm -hmm. dial watch with no hands. Yeah. Right. That's actually kind of cool looking. Um, but that's the thing. It's like a lot of the coolest looking watches just aren't super practical for actually telling. No, them. they're fashion accessories. I was going to say exactly. And, you know, the other thing is that like, because my brother's a watch guy, is mm -hmm. that it, it, it gets super crazy with like the movements and stuff like that, with the, mm -hmm. the gears and all this kind of stuff and crystal backs so that you can look at the movements and like, um, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? The the mechanism that like auto wines or whatever and people have like special containers that auto wine their watches oh yeah not wearing them and stuff it's, like it's that. it's a whole ecosystem of products it's to support a whole your watch. crazy <laughs> world once you start getting into watches so we've got some new philippe uh, uh, patek uh, as well here which if you're into that style the patek has some some styles that are like better than others and this is so we got the front and the back and uh, yeah, so that's it. So just, it's nice to see that the traditional watch world isn't standing still. I mean, they have to be even more innovative to you know, compete. And a lot of these are competing in the higher end market. Like how many of us are spending 10 grand, 10 grand on a watch? Or, four, or 440 grand for that matter. Mm. Or $400. So, <laughs> so then that, I just very quickly then, Will, what's your favorite non-smartwatch, non-fitness tracker that, uh, that you have? Non smartwatch, non fitness tracker. Because you used uh, to be a watch. I'm I a did, watch yeah. Guy, right? I I had these watches called Tokyo Flash. Mm -hmm. Um, a bunch of them. Oh, if if Tasha Do you remember a model like, name? Um, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Okay. Because uh, they change their models all the time. I'm not sure they still have them. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you just even go to the website. Tasia, if you don't like something that's hard to tell the time, you'd hate these watches even more. Oh my more. gosh. Um, they've got, <laughs> actually the one on the far right there, it's one oh. of the ones I had. Sorry, on that last image. Oh no. Oh, okay. 
There. That this one. one here? Oh, this no, here. No, no, far right, far right. My this right. One. Yeah. That green one. Yeah. It almost looks like a radar screen or something. Yeah, it does. Wild. Yeah. So, yeah. W- okay. <laughs> this one with the maze. Good luck. And I've always wanted a, a nit- what's it called? A Nitsy watch or a... A Nixie watch. Yeah, with Nixie, Nixie, watch, Nixie yeah. tubes. Yeah, Steve Wozniak has one of those. They're yeah. huge, though. Yeah. So these ones, it's complicated. It's hard mm. to tell the time. <laughs> So not not super glanceable. No, no. How about how about you, Tasha? What uh, do you of your non? Because you're you have an Apple Watch now. Of your non Apple watches or pre Apple Watch, uh, what, what what style did you like? So okay. I don't even I don't even know where my old watches are because I haven't uh-huh. owned a watch in forever. But I used to just back in the day, you know, good old Fossil. <gasps> yeah, I had a Fossil. Um, that was my go-to brand. So uh-huh. I'm sure I can find it somewhere, but. I don't know. What about you, Tristan? I, yeah, I, I have a whole bunch of watches. And then I, when I started working from home more, I started wearing watches less. And I've had some cool watches over the years. No, nothing super fancy per se, but I did have a fossil watch that somebody's got me for my which is 30th birthday, 40, 40th birthday, I think. And it had, um, it had like a matrix style background to it, uh, which was kind of neat. But uh, Fossil's got all sorts of styles. And um, did they, what's the one, did they, they, were they the ones that had the stores as well? Oh, yeah, they had stores. Yeah, yeah. so like at the, yeah. um, at the Tulela uh, Outlet Mall, I think there's a Fossil yeah. store. Yeah, yeah, they had stores. A good brand is um, Shinola. I don't mm-hmm. own Shinola. Like they're pricier than what like a Fossil watch would be, but obviously not like a, four hundred thousand dollar price point um but they're like handcrafted and stuff in detroit um so not everything is fully made there some products come from italy like some of the leather strapping and things Mm -hmm. like that but they Mm -hmm. everything is done by hand um to put their watches together and they've got just a really nice collection and some they have like manual ones and some Mm -hmm. are automatic and so People that are really into watches really like that brand. Shinola. My uh, mm-hmm. my brother has quite a few Omega watches. Um, it's like James about, Bond. Yeah, don't even get him started. I often <laughs> joke that he's 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 living vicariously through like Roger Moore and stuff like oh. that. Like he's learned how to shoot a gun and drive a big rig just because he wants all these things on his like things that he can do list. Mm -hmm. Um, He could jump out of a plane, fly an airplane. Um, Anyways, he has several watches and I often tell him, don't tell me how much they cost because I know roughly that they're tens of thousands of dollars and I just really don't want to (laughs) know. That's it. Doctors are paid far too much. Time to cut back. (laughs) Yeah. All right, moving on to some other follow-up. Uh, last year, we were talking about Hertz, the uh, rental car company that was suffering a little bit during the pandemic, mm. because as it turns out, when people don't go anywhere, they don't tend to rent a whole lot of cars. Mm. So they restructured, and when they came out of bankruptcy, they end up with a big whack of uh, capital that then they were able to deploy, and they signed a deal with Tesla to secure uh Thousands of Tesla Model 3s and Model Ys for the Hertz rental car fleet as they moved towards EVs. I guess one of the benefits is that EVs tend to have lower ongoing maintenance costs as well. But Hertz isn't done yet. They have just uh, signed a deal with a new electric vehicle partner in the form of Polestar, which is a division of Volvo. And you can see the Polestar cars have bit of a Volvo vibe uh, to them. And the very very first Polestar was actually a Volvo model. And so they've released a few, um, a couple of models of Polestars. Polestar 2 is the current one, I believe. But Hertz will buy 65,000 Polestar EVs over the next five years to be deployed in Europe, North America, and Australia. So they're, of course, really banking on the world coming back to traveling more. Even some people I know are, are traveling more. And then as part of that travel, Rental cars is part of it, and, and I, I suspect rental cars may be doing may, might do maybe disproportionately better, as some people may still be not entirely comfortable with like doing like tour buses and stuff like that. They may wish to have their own little cocoon, and if you can have an EV, well, you've got a that cool factor, and maybe gives you an opportunity to test drive something that you might consider buying in the next few years. Especially well, there's a whole cluster if the prices come down. with mm-hmm. rental cars. Like I know that in Hawaii, when the pandemic hit, they sold um, a 
a lot of the rental car companies just sold most of their fleets. Um, and then when people started coming back at various times, there were no rental cars, so some of them were starting to go nuts. I don't know if you bumped into that, Tejo, on any of your travels in various places, but oh, yeah. there's a serious problem with getting a rental car at one point. Big time, big time, especially on the islands. Like you were saying, we you had to book super far in advance, and then even then it was jam-packed, and it was like such a Seinfeld moment of like, so you can take the reservation, but you can't hold the reservation. <laughs> Which is the and whole really point. the holding is the most important part. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was jammed, jammed. But now, traveling after that, though, like when I went um, in January, I went back home and I rented a car because there was still cross-border issues. So I drove over and not a problem. Mm. And I used Hertz. So did you rent a re traditional gas powered vehicle or an EV? I did rent traditional gas because I'm cheap <laughs> and I had spent a lot of money on the tickets. And so I was like, listen, I'm sorry, it Tom Brady, but I'm going to go with the gas vehicle. For so, this trip. but, th but, there's the, the the question about the math when it comes to rental cars is what is mm -hmm. the premium for renting an EV versus how much you're going to be paying in gas while you have that EV uh, and like were you was were you not going to be doing enough driving to make it worthwhile to go for the EV based on the premium that they were asking for? Yes. Okay. So the tri the specific trip I was doing it was really like my family lives a literal two minute drive from each other. So, you know, I was not using gas. I literally, after we went back over the border, filled up the quarter tank that I had used for gotcha. the two weeks I was there. So it wouldn't have made sense. But if you're doing a trip where like maybe a road trip or something where every single day somebody's going on an excursion with the car, then you may have a toss up, especially now with the price of gas. Mm. And I just read an article earlier today that People and the industry were, were have been expecting the EV prices would drop over the next few years, but thanks to a little war in Europe, mm -hmm. that uh, and uh, certain supply constraints on various uh, materials that might go into said EVs, that uh, could be a bit longer than expected. So uh, maybe next time you rent a Cartage, it'll be an e-bike. <laughs> Perhaps I'll just strap the luggage to the back. <laughs> It'll be fine. Speaking of wars, uh, this one breaks my heart a little bit. A retro computer museum in Mariupol in Ukraine, beloved by children, was attacked by Russia. Thanks, thanks, Putin. So just another example of some of the collateral damage or indiscriminate uh, shelling. This was a retro computer museum. And these have cropped up all over the world. Some of them uh, more professional, like there is the... Living Computers Museum in Seattle that I've visited a few years ago in 2017. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Um, there's, so there's a number of these large scale sort of nonprofit museums that are around. And then there's some of these smaller ones that just have a bunch of like retro computers and video game consoles and whatnot and for enthusiasts, middle -aged, a, lot, a lot of middle-aged white dudes no. <laughs> and others. Oh. And, uh, but also they serve as a way to introduce uh, younger generations to the joy mm -hmm. and relative simplicity of some of these vintage uh, computing platforms. So in this uh, photo here, we've got a Commodore 64C, looks like an, an Atari 800 XL, um, an IBM PC. I'm not sure what that is in behind that kid's head there. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, this was a, a casualty and there's no no details on how badly it, the said computer uh, retro computer museum uh, has been damaged at this point. But uh, you can see in some of the photos here that what the, you know, pre-attack with some of the things they had, including some Radio Shack, uh, Tandy, TRS-80s, and Color Computer, Coco 2, um, and some other European computers that we don't see so much over in North America here. So, so just sad. another example of, you know, so we've got, we've seen schools hit, we've seen hospitals, ma maternity hospitals, and more. So um, hopefully things will be wrapping up soon there, but it's going to be, I think it's mm. going to probably drag out for a while longer. Uh, on, the, on, on the positive side, however, there 
was the official opening of the uh, cave retro uh, exhibition. So there's a channel by a fellow named Neil on YouTube. It used to be called Retro Man Cave, and now it's just called RMC. And for years and years, he has been doing uh, videos featuring you know, vi vintage uh, computer gear and doing refurbishments Amazing. and all sorts of uh, neat projects. And one of the projects that he started during the pandemic was, you know, he thought, why not uh, set up his own you know, retro computer museum? He's because he's accumulated so many yeah. uh, uh, over the years. So I, I enjoy his um, his videos. He refer his audience is referred to as cave dwellers. He has a bit of merch on the site. He usually does a, a charity calendar um, every, every year. Uh, as well, I think the last uh, calendar featured uh, computers that were um, like all had crashed uh, screens on them <laughs> to like error messages and whatnot. But the just as and this is a perfect example of ongoing storytelling in the in YouTube uh, uh, platform. Mm -hmm. You you could see just all the different stages and all the rent. He, he gutted this loft, so he uh, he's based in England, uh, north. I can't remember the exact area, but it's northwest of London. And he rented the upper level of this old timey, like former mill, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's, you could see, I think, in the from uh, exterior shots, there's like a water wheel and stuff. And so he's rented the uh, most of the top level and basically gutted it and has set up all sorts of different areas in this top floor. One area for playing with uh, and using the computer systems for people who come and uh, come and visit the museum. He has a library section with with all sorts of computer magazines from mostly from the 80s, some from the 90s. He's even set up one room as a recreation of a, a store, a computer store. And he's mm. gotten the uh, and re restored the boxes from a lot of software. And so he's hung, hung them up on the wall. He's got the slat board, you know, like from old stores in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And got the whole thing set up there. It's, it's, it's really neat. And he's, he has... Um, talks there on a regular basis so they had an initial friends and family night a few weeks ago and then just this past week they had an event the first official open to the public event and you go to the website to book your times and it's funny i, I mentioned middle-aged white dudes like virtually everyone who was there for this opening event was a middle-aged white dude but uh it's just it's it's neat to see someone's uh, hobby and their passion you know sort of evolve from simply doing like YouTube videos to actually doing something in the real world that mm -hmm. involves people connecting with each other over a shared interest. And especially as we slowly but surely come out of the pandemic, you know, it's perfect timing for him, for people to be able to uh, hopefully safely uh, convene in places like this. So that's my this goal. is um, sending me down memory lane because, well, first of all, this, this community is very tight. There's actually quite a few people around the world that do this, and it usually starts as like their own personal curation. Um, and I knew somebody in Brantford, Ontario, that had the personal computer museum, and his name was Sid. He has recently passed a couple years ago, mm -hmm. um, but it was like the coolest curation that started as his own personal collection that was open to the public and he would collect new things all the time every year and educate kids and educate the public on all kinds of old games, all kinds of old computers, keyboards, different technology, like anything you could think of. And if you needed to find something, Sid would have had it <laughs> like <laughs> in his personal computer museum. Um, so it was a really cool um, little community that he had built. And then since he passed, one of his friends um, has been working with the city to try and make sure that a lot of these items get preserved because there is such a history there and it is so educational for us all to see like just how quick technology evolves is kind of mind-blowing so what you know it's funny to watch like little kids go into a space like that and like they're like what is this you know <laughs> it's just like well, this was only this many years ago and now that is this you know and we can put this much storage here you know and so it's just kind of this really cool thing for people to see, but this is a trip. It's sending me down memory lane. I love it. Now, Tasha, what was some of your um, fondest uh, computer or video game consoles from when you were growing up? Oh my God. Well, first I have to tell you guys, like I was floppy disk era. That mm. was kind of what I grew up, but what we used to do. So y'all remember dial up internet, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you know, and what we used to do, because there was no 
instant messaging back then. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, we would, my friends and I would physically call each other and be like, okay, go online now. Okay. Go online now. And then we hang up the phones. We need the phone lines. We're going online. And then we would email each other and like, wait, <laughs> and like refresh the email browser and like, whoop, there's the response. And then like, we'd e we thought it was the coolest thing <laughs> for such nerds. But that was before, you know, like then we had like a lot of instant messaging came like, right, like probably within the next year after that. I mean, it happened very quickly. And then there were chat rooms and there were just, you know, like all kinds of crazy stuff like that. But those are my memories of late grade school, early high school, you know, pre cell phone, <laughs> pre anything. It was pretty fun. Well, some of us grew up without any internet at all. The internet existed, you know, mostly for military and academic uh, situations. But back in the eighties, you know, mm -hmm. normies like us didn't have didn't didn't have internet access. So we were on a whole different generation of computers. Will, what was your uh, what your your fondest uh, computer uh, vintage computer and or video game consoles from growing up? You know, um, I mean, I grew up grew up remembering, especially the Atari twenty six hundred. Mm -hmm. um as a fairly young kid um and just being blown away by it so like oh, of course things like pitfall yars revenge river raid um nice. what was the submarine one was it sea quest or something or it, it was something like that one. yeah i think there's an activision one yeah an activision one so i remember that um i remember actually getting the infamous et game i didn't <laughs> buy it it was like my brother's friend basically gave it to us because it was crap. And, saved it from uh, a landfill. <laughs> saved it from a landfill. And I remember just like not understanding how any of it worked and just like played it a couple of times and let it go. Um, but yeah, that that's, that's a big memory for me. I mean, I think probably one of the things when it comes to games that I hold most dear is the arcade experience. I love mm -hmm. the arcade experience. I love going in and seeing what the new games were and playing the games. And um, I, I'm kind of a weirdo um, that I like watching other people play video games almost as much as I like playing games myself. So an arcade was fun just to see people go in and, and play games. And, you know, I was obsessed with things like Gauntlet and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle four player games and the X Men four player game and Samurai Showdown and uh, Street Fighter. I could go on and on. I, I'm a big lover of video games, and um, and so yeah, I, I just the, for me the arcade experience. There's something special about going to an arcade. And Tristan, you and I have been to that arcade in New West a bunch of times, and I I I really want to go back because for me there's just something about you know, it's so weird because they're single use, they're not efficient, you know, they take quarters, like it's a total archaic thing. But for some reason, just the experience of walking around and being with other people and experiencing these things, like, yeah, I can play all those games in a collection on my Xbox or my PlayStation. I have mm -hmm. some of those collections, like the best of Capcom and stuff like that. But there's something a lot different about going there and it being communal and going to a place. Yeah, there was something different about like the high scores, you know, yes. like when you're there. Yes. And and it it's it only exists in that space, like yes. that physical space. Yes. And you have to beat somebody whoever this kid is at Frogger, you yes. know. <laughs> it's just Well, like, this place in New West, they put they put the high scores on a board. But behind the uh, bar or whatever or what well, You can't get more physical than that. Yeah. Kids these days have no clue. <laughs> they have zero clue. <laughs> Next time you're in town, Tasia, we got it. We have to drag you over there. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. I would love to. Do uh, they have like Pac-Man and Frogger and? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Those are my jams. Yeah. So. so one of the <laughs> next the the next phase for the RMC cave is they're going to use one of the other rooms on the top floor and build out a secret arcade because as it is now, it's focused mostly on computer uh, vintage computer cons consoles and video game consoles and they only have one upright arcade machine it's a galaxian uh, machine galaxian which is the forerunner to galaga which is in my opinion a superior game but they have this galaxian yeah. um uh, arcade cabinet but it only barely works they've had to work, do repairs on it a number of times but they are going to be setting up you know they're doing uh, 
I'm not sure if it's a Kickstarter or what, but they're doing some crowdfunding to get the uh, secret arcade uh, room built too, which just add an extra feature and more appeal. So next time I'm in England, I totally want to drag my wife. <laughs> to, to I'll see go this. with you. You coming to England with us? Sure. All right, let's do it. You can. Well, let's pack extra. Well, maybe one of the the camera bags or something. Because you know, we'll, yeah, just we'll, expense it. Exactly, we make it a business trip. Exactly, it's a business trip. So you can find out about that at R rmcretro dot com. You can see he's even like he has a shrink wrap machine too uh, for all the boxes, of, the box software, and other products in the you know in the the store room of uh, the exhibit. It's the attention to detail is remarkable. So it's been really neat to see it take shape. So that's at rmcretro dot com. You know, the other thing that reminds me of now that we're having this conversation is remember when we talked about um, the whole thing with uh, video stores mm -hmm. last year and about like the last the, blockbuster, the last blockbuster. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. So it kind of reminds me of that to a certain extent. Yeah, the 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 sense of place and the unique experience you get from being with other people mm -hmm. to enjoy entertainment or to select your entertainment to take home and just like the, you know, buying the, the, the snacks and all that sort of thing, as opposed to just like scrolling for 45 minutes on your, on your smart TV or your, uh, your uh, set top box, trying to figure out what, what to watch. It's like, mm -hmm. I think that's half of the time is just spent trying to figure out what to watch. Cause there's so much and there's so much crap too. If there's like a big red N logo, in the top corner of the show, it's usually crap. That's the, the Netflix originals. Yep. 80%. I mean, the 20% is pretty good. But the other 80% is just like shove, the entertainment equivalent, equivalent of shovelware. It gives me hope that like I really could pitch a show to Netflix. Because apparently. <laughs> I have terrible ideas too. Yeah. They'll <laughs> produce anything. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving right along so the one of the big stories in the last couple of days is around twitter but there was actually a twitter story from a couple of weeks ago that was hoping to get you tasia to comment on very quickly and now it's kind of old news but if anyone and so we'll just spend like just a few seconds on this twitter dm search now works the way you'd expect so apparently this was an issue for people searching their DMs or direct messaging uh, a Porsche tab in the Twitter app on their phone or their iPad. And am I to understand, Tasia, that all this time it's been almost impossible to find old messages? Yes. So when you go into your messages, like you'd have to manually scroll and search for stuff. So. Now, Within each different conversation with different people. So you have to remember yes. who it was you're speaking to and yes. then scroll. Oh, boy. Exactly. So there's actually two new features here. So there's this one where you can now there's a search bar at the top and you can search by keyword, by name, by, you know, so like if you're like, oh, I know I talked about, I don't know, Taylor Swift or something, you know what I mean? Like you can search for that. And too then, many results. I mean, how do you too find many it? results? Too many results. Um, then it'll narrow down which conversations you know you had and you can go oh okay it was this person and then you could narrow down by okay these keywords within that um which is great super helpful but also new um in this in the messages section of twitter is you can pin conversations now just like we can you know on iMessage and everything like that you can now if you swipe you can pin a conversation to the top so if you know you're having like an important DM interaction with somebody like, you know, some people do promotions or business inquiries or whatever on Twitter and you want to be able to quickly access that, you can pin it to the top now. Nice. Yeah. I thought so, it was a nice little update. Now have you So used they really the reworked it. Since I've been... used I tried out the search one because I was like, oh this I wonder if it actually works. And it does. I was like, oh, okay. Um the pin one I haven't used yet, but I love that idea. Just because I haven't needed to yet, like I, people aren't really sliding into my DMs a lot anymore. Um, it's fine, but um, it is handy though because I have had people reach out via Twitter DM for like actual inquiries, not you know, and and not just me and like my friend goofing around on something, but like for actual media things. So that would be a perfect use case why I would pin that at the top. I want to remember this, and then once the project is closed, I could like unpin it or something. Very handy. 
How long ago did Twitter introduce direct messages? It seems like it's oh. reasonably early on. And yeah, long time. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter itself is what, like 15 years old now or so? And we're just now getting the ability to search I our know. direct messages. My coworker complains about searching in Slack. Um, mm. He doesn't like, I won't mention names, but he doesn't like anyone sending messages <clears throat> Like in, because one of the powers of Slack is you can set up, you know, subgroups. He only wants his messages to go to one group. He doesn't want other conversations because otherwise he'll lose track of the conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, Slack is fine, but when, if, what, about four years ago or so, people were just losing their minds over how Slack is like, so is this going to be this huge productivity booster and, you know, you don't have yeah. to be trapped in email anymore. And, and I just looked at it and said, and, and then when I started using it in a couple of uh, work applicate um, environments, like this is just another. It's another <laughs> thing to have. And yeah. it's another, it's another thing to get, interrupt you with notifications um, and whatnot. Yes. And it's like, yes. is this actually helping? Like I, I appreciate the, the, the archive sense of it and whereby if you have certain project conversations, you know, all the information is in one thing, if, and that's useful if the search feature works properly, but if it doesn't, it well, does. yeah, good, good luck. So yeah, it's just one more. Thing. Yep. Look, Slack is messenger to electric boogaloo. Like, I mean, what, why was it such a re revelation? I didn't find it yeah. that much of a leap forward other than I guess there, you can have groups and stuff like that, but, uh, Otherwise, but you can do that on so many other apps you can too. Do that and on it's, so many other, yeah. nothing is a replacement for email. I think that's what the big miss was on that whole initial PR push was yeah. like, I don't like, I think you misbranded. It worked for them, obviously. They're still doing great, but it was yeah. just an odd claim mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. like, I still live and my life is still organized via email. It just Me is. Too. It's super yeah. searchable. I have dates and names for everything. I've got contact information, especially you guys know I'm obsessed with Gmail and contact stuff is saved immediately for me. I can you should make... do a video about Gmail sometime. Really should do like one or two, right? <laughs> the next two are literally on Gmail again. Um, but like, it's just, to me, it's just like, I don't, I don't know how a chat could replace that. We have to send things <laughs> like, I don't know. It just well, you start never getting made sense to me. you start getting it blurred too because people will send me documents and stuff on on Slack, and it's oh, just no. like, and I that's know. part of what my coworker is saying is like, don't send me things no. in Slack because it's harder to search, and now I have more places. Not only is it email and Slack, but it could be different chats. It's not always easy to, you know, target yeah. where somebody was talking about something or where that conversation happened. This is a good lesson for anybody listening is if you're going to use, you know, because a lot of companies, obviously we use, I just chalk, chalk them into like the chat services category, whether yeah. you want to say it's like project organization or project, whatever it is, there's that category. I think there's a huge difference in like, you have to communicate to your team when sending files and documents, when sending certain information, it has to be done in email because that is a timestamp thing. It's super easily searchable. You know, everything is there in streamline. You're not going between different softwares and services to be like, who sent that thing when, yeah. where is this document now? And the worst part without naming the organization I work at is that some <laughs> some places some, check his some, LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah. Don't shh. <laughs> some departments uh, use Slack. Some use what is it? Cisco Jabber. Some oh, use uh, Basecamp. Like there's Nightmare. all sorts of yeah. No, there's Why? like yeah, there's Microsoft weird. Teams. There's yeah. Yeah, there's Yammer as well, which is also yeah. Microsoft. And I think for messaging, I like I, I like to restrict messaging to like really, really time sensitive stuff yes. and slightly slower communications and communications that are good to have a paper trail for. And even including documents, attachments and the, and the like 
I prefer that email as well. When people start sending me like these huge ma messages via one messaging service or another, whether, whether it's Teams or iMessage, it's just like, no, no, I need. And I'll sometimes just end up copying a message into an email to reply and have mm -hmm. a paper trail that way too. Same, I, I get bugged the same way about like even like LinkedIn direct messages and stuff yeah. too, like, especially when people have my email address. Oh my God. Well, like, li it's... LinkedIn is half the time it's garbage <laughs> because there's mm -hmm. so many like, hey, we noticed that your website is blah, blah, blah. Do you want to be number one? One on Google, like I get that so often. Yeah, yeah number one on me. Google. <laughs> All right. So speaking of uh, Twitter, there was some other news in the last day. Gee, or two. what are you going to talk about? I couldn't imagine. What. Uh, well, a certain um, eccentric billionaire responsible for the the uh, reinvigoration of the electric uh, car space, EV space, and. Uh, uh, reinvigoration of space flight you know, through SpaceX and uh, not to mention other things like boring company Hyperloop and whatnot uh, multi uh, multi uh, faceted uh, oh yeah the Starlink the satellite anyway so Elon Musk yes we haven't talked about Elon in a little while Five so minutes. he just invested um, however many billions of dollars and is now the single largest shareholder of Twitter he owns about 9% of Twitter now yeah 9.2% uh, of Twitter. And I don't recall what was, uh, what was the, what was the amount? Will can Google it. And um, so as part of, uh, I guess the deal, cause he's been apparently talking to them for a while. He is now on their board of directors. And, you know, we know that Elon has been, active on Twitter mm -hmm. over the last few years, for better or for worse. He is a A1 troll. Sometimes he's got, he gets a foot and mouth uh, disease a little bit. And he likes to have fun on there. You know, he's a quirky guy. 2.64 billion. 2.64. Oh, I think he found that between his couch cushions. Basically. So it's going to be interesting because he has made some public pronouncements about uh, free speech has disagreed with certain people, including the former president being banned from Twitter, especially given that there are certain other very problematic politicians from other countries that are still on there, such as, you know, uh, from Iran and, uh, and there's an official Putin account as well, too. It's like, OK, so what, what are the rules and how how. Uh, how, uh, how how consistent are we with enforcing the, these things? So I think he's going to be throwing his weight a little a bit uh, around a little bit on the board. And then, of course, you know, as an avid Twitter user, going to be maybe pushing for certain <laughs> features. So related to that, on April 1st, <laughs> on April 1st, Twitter tweeted out, we are working on an edit button. So I don't know if Twitter has decided they're th themselves they're going to be Twitter trolls now, because of course people like started freaking out about this. We see 1.3 million likes, 100, so you know, funny. almost 130 million quote tweets, 120 uh, uh, thousand, sorry, 120 30 thousand quote tweets, 120 thousand retweets. But it's April 1st. It's before noon. You see 10:50 a.m. Mm -hmm. timestamp. Are they, were they actually working on an edit button? Because they've consistently denied it. And this has been one of the most um, common requests for years and years. And Jack Dorsey, one of the original co-founders of Twitter, and until just a few months ago was a CEO again of Twitter, had always said, well, you know, it's a nice idea, but it doesn't work technically just the way uh, Twitter servers are federated and whatnot and the propagation time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you wouldn't want people to tweet a thing and then have other people react to it and then people to change the original tweet yeah. and then for it to lose the context and all that. And others said, well, you could have like a change log so people could look, see the original tweets. But most people simply want an edit button so they can catch their freaking typos. Yes. <laughs> I know, but this is why we can't have nice things, right? because that exact reason i was just reading an article like people mm -hmm. are freaking out like if twitter does this like it's the end of the internet as we know it because it's just like you know people freaking out that exactly what you just said someone's going to tweet something you and i will like it or interact with whatever it is and then someone's going to change it it's going to be super inappropriate and now we're nazis or whatever <laughs> exactly and now everybody associated with this tweet and yeah. it, you know and it's over for us all um, they're canceling. And so like, I, I love it in theory because of how normies think mm -hmm. we think that way. We, the masses just want it in terms of 
oh, for Pete's sakes, I spelled this damn word wrong, you know? And it's, it's just, like when, it's like you only so notice innocent. typos just after you send, like with an email. Yeah. Just after. Or like every you forget, time. You, re- you remember to send an att- to include an attachment just after you sent an email. <laughs> that same kind yeah. of like, oh, no. Every time. Yeah. Which I think was their purpose of, didn't we talk about this before, of them implementing like, um, did I dream this or did we talk about this? <laughs> or did they do this? Where I like when you're sending a tweet, so it's not an edit button but it allows you to like have the review of it right yep, before. Yep. Yes. I haven't because... seen it myself, but it might, maybe it's only for Twitter blue users still, or maybe I haven't seen it out. yet either. So I don't mm. know if they're going to roll it out to, to free freemium yeah. users. Um, it's kind of like the Gmail not. feature where you have a little bit of time before it actually goes yes. out. Yes, <clears throat> Which is free Twitter, get on board. Um, so that I think would solve most people. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because yeah, then yeah. you'd go, oh, okay, at least I got it. I had between five to 20 seconds, you know, you can pick your, you know, and yeah. oops, caught the mistake. Okay, there it goes out. I think that would at least placate the masses and us normies who aren't trying to do anything malicious. Yeah. Um, we have no malintent on the platform, <laughs> but I do see that both the technical issues of it, also the user interface issues of it, mm-hmm. and then also just the implications of it uh, in the wrong hands. And part of it is a semantic issue, and like you said, a user interface issue. And what if you you need? What if you only notice after the initial time limit of whether twenty seconds or whatever the case is, and you need you want to go back to fix a legitimate mistake? And so the question is, will the geniuses at Twitter be able to figure out a way to roll this feature in if they are indeed going to do it so that there will be an archive of the original tweets so that it, maybe the community will self-police. And if someone if someone tries to significantly alter the content or context of, of a tweet after the fact, after many people have engaged with it, you, it's very clear what's going on there. You could have a visible change. Like, like that shouldn't be too hard, but it's just a question of working it into their, existi- their existing uh, you know, user interface paradigm because it's not just desktop, it's mobile as well. And all these things have to mm-hmm. be discoverable and easily visible. So part- And you're uh, also trusting mm-hmm. people to go back through a thread mm-hmm. and That's, see yeah. where something originates, which, y'all, do you go past the first page of a Google search result? <laughs> no. Not so, so like, it's just that thing of like, and, and there's going to be also just users that don't know to do, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, so it's just, there's a few hurdles and I think there could be other alternatives like, say if you go to delete a tweet that you put out and you're like oh this is erroneous Mm -hmm. maybe there's something when you're about to delete it when you already have the message like are you sure you want to delete maybe there's like a copy button there that you can it'll delete that but you could just copy over what you've typed out like do you know what i mean replace your little edits and resend a separate thing so i I don't know but there's got to be a workaround slack slack actually says edited next to a message mm-hmm. if you edit the even message, facebook does too yeah yeah so mm-hmm. i mean there's ways of doing it yeah. um just to jump in I, I i mean i'm gonna kind of help myself here i i'm dyslexic and i have some trouble reading sometimes i scan things um i jump over things reading's always been a bit of uh, a challenge for me um and i have to force myself and sometimes i make mistakes and uh i make a lot of spelling mistakes and i'm very conscious about it i would love an undo button um i've deleted messages because it's bugged me even if someone said something and i've just been like oh man i'm just going to delete that and repost it (laughs) i don't care if i lose a couple likes or retweets or whatever i'm the same way just because i'm anal retentive <laughs> yeah but this this tweet though so elon musk so, is genius so will we've got daddy elon to the rescue here yes. so yes. after after it was announced that he was investing in twitter and uh you know it, it, all these things happen very uh quickly and then there's the board announcement mm-hmm. and then he posts do you want an edit button 
And instead of yes and no, the options are <laughs> Y-S-E and O-N. And, O-N. Yeah. and of course, and some people like didn't under, they, some people thought it was a prank because they were misspelled or maybe they just didn't understand like that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> like, like that's part of the, that's part of the joke. It's not necessarily a prank, but he's just like, you know, it's for reasons like this. It might be nice to be able to edit stuff. Yeah. So you can see, you know, a hundred uh, sorry, 1.4 million votes uh, on this. And um yeah, I think largely people wanted uh, an an edit button. Thanks to uh, you know, so it it if if it was to actually happen, now the question is: Was Twitter's original April first uh, message legitimate? Well, later on today, after Elon's tweet, Twitter confirms it will test an edit button. <laughs> so. Got, you know, it's, 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 you blink and you'll miss it, right? So this feature will be available to paying Twitter Blue subscribers, at least at first. But you know, Twitter's got to figure a way to monetize because advertising is a rough business, and they have a mm-hmm. fraction of the advertising market share that Facebook and that and, and Google do. So we'll see if they ever roll it out to the rest of us that don't pay for Twitter Blue. So apparently, they say they've been working on an edit feature since last year, and no, they didn't get the idea from a poll, winky face from. Elon Musk or otherwise. So um, here we go. So it's it's it, it, it sounds like it's happening, and you know whether or not Elon had anything to do with it. You know, it's he, I mean, he'll probably take the credit regardless, right? Sure. And then he'll and then because he just wants to be able to tweet from Mars and then uh, make his uh, then correct his uh, tweets after the fact. Um, oh God, I'm gonna choke as I try to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we could use. AI to make sure people aren't changing the messaging. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got too excited about my AI comment. <laughs> well, that's uh that's that's definitely a thing, you know. There's there's lots of AI tools that are that are emerging as well and it could yeah. be part of the process. Or or here's here's an idea. How about uh how about a spell checker? Yeah. <laughs> You Just know saying. that Grammarly is is Grammarly. getting pretty good. Sometimes <laughs> it changes things when I don't want it to. I'm just like, I, I want to use two adjectives. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> All right. So um, I don't know if our comrade in arms is going to be joining us or not. And I'm looking at the clock here. So maybe there's a few things that uh, we can skip till next time because I know that one of one of the three of us is in a bit of pain at the moment and uh, has been doing very well, yes. aside from choking on occasion as her body shuts down. So uh, a whole other injury. Just like, uh, uh. I know. Now I got another injury, the thing oh, that I do. Come on. But there's one thing that uh, I thought was important uh, for us to take about to talk about is Coca-Cola Bite. Yeah. <laughs> Coke thinks it knows what pixels taste like. Oh, huh? Coke's newest Lord. flavor is coming soon. And uh, yeah, it's so it's, of course, it's a zero sugar option. I mean, why don't they just Ew. like have a regular seriously like, option as so well? So it tastes too? like aspartame and chemical. Yeah, Perfect. exactly. But, you know, we as we talked about last year, the new Coke zero sugar is an improvement over the previous Coke zero sugar. I think we all yeah. agreed. I on, agree. On that one. I have yeah. a whole rant, though, about the color of the cans. Can we can we oh, do that? Oh, of the, uh, of the regular Coke Zero? Of the sugar? regular Coke Zero. Okay. And go. I know. Rant. Okay, go. Uh, and as you guys know, I'm a I'm a aficionado of Coke Zero and Diet Connoisseur, Coke. one might say. Yeah, connoisseur. <laughs> um, so the thing that bugs me, and I understand uh, maybe I'm too brainy or I'm the 1% or something, but like I could tell the difference between a black can or bottle that says Coca-Cola Zero on it and a red can that said Coca-Cola on it. Apparently they were having trouble with people not knowing that the black can is associated with the red can. And so now they're all red cans and Coke has white text on it Mm. and Coke Zero has red text on it. How many times have I picked up the wrong can or bottle in a store? Because you have to look at the text. It's not the color of the can. They should and know it... we don't read. <laughs> yes. It's and like, also, it's like I'm serious. <laughs> 
you should just be able to 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 see it like at a glance. You shouldn't have to look at the font. So, I, anyways, that's just my rant. I I I'm very interested about this bite flavor. They will get me at least buying it once. So we'll see you how it guys, goes. But we should do like a in person taste test. Like what I'm saying is I'm up. Fly to Van- I'm gonna fly to Vancouver. Yes. We yes. all try it together. Do it. Yes. I think there's nothing more appropriate to spend my money on. Mm-hmm. I agree. Because that would be fun. I don't even we- drink pop, but I would do it. We could do it at Capital City Arcade in New Westminster. Sounds See? like a plan. Right? So it, it, all come, it all comes together. Do you remember the Pepsi Taste Challenge? I remember it would be at like malls or on the street or whatever. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I would love to go and do it, even though we hated Pepsi. Um, Because it was just, it was in commercials and it was fun and you got free pop. So I remember as a kid, like seeing one of those and being like, ah, we got to do it. I may have shared this story before, but in the summer of 1989, June 1989, I believe, that Heat Wave 89 teen dance at Canada Place. They had the Pepsi Challenge there. Oh, yeah. And I took the Pepsi Challenge. Had and? One taste, had another taste. And they said, which one do you like better? And I pointed at uh, one of the two and said, I like that one better because it's Coke. And then they revealed <laughs> it and it was Coke. And they're like, all right, here's a coupon for a Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they did. Yeah. It's like. All right, I'll take it. But, uh, oh, you know. That is so funny. <laughs> so, this Coke Bite, apparently, there's a tie in to what they're doing, uh, of course, on the internet with uh, Fortnite, but also the metaverse. There's an AR game mm-hmm. as well, and, you know, all, all the things. So, hence the techie kind of uh, angle to this Coke Bite, Coca Cola Bite. The, uh, they said it tastes like pixels. They've even got a pixelated Coca Cola thing there. So, they're trying to jump on the trend there so we'll have to see what it actually tastes like now will if you had to guess what do pixels taste like what would you say electricity Ooh. <laughs> how about you tasia boy you went for something like? like that i was going for more like texture wise <laughs> like i don't know like crunchy um, um it's like, like pop rocks <laughs> Yeah, but like zingy, but like crunchy. Yeah, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. a little gritty, like dirt, but not taste like dirt. I'm a texture person. <laughs> a as long as it answer. doesn't, as long as it's not like runny eggs. No. If uh, to quote The Simpsons, uh, I suspect it tastes like burning. Yes, I was <laughs> thinking that. Yeah. So we'll have to check that out when it finally. Uh, finally makes it and we were hoping that gray was going to be here for this portion but we teased it so we've got to talk about it and i know tasia is super thrilled about the official trailer for star trek strange new worlds finally dropped after a couple of teasers tasia how exciting excited are you on a scale of one to ten to finally see this own dedicated series starring anson mount as captain pike the original captain of the uss enterprise I would say zero, but the scale oh. is only one to ten. So I guess I'll say one. But look at it. Just look at I it. I okay. mean, I can appreciate the cinematography, <laughs> I suppose. It's definitely got a classic Trek vibe to it. Will, how about you? I, I am interested. I mean, I, I, I would kind of like them to stop retreading ground and go forward. Uh, mm-hmm. just like they did with the next generation back in the late 80s, early 90s. But, um, I mean, this is an interesting time period, interesting character, so I'm certainly going to watch it. And I I am excited about it, but it's just always my rant about any... I'm ranting a lot today. <laughs> my rant about any fiction is go forward, not back. Um, you're always going to have problems when you go back and do prequels. Um, mm-hmm. People know what the story is going to be, and then you start overwriting yourself, which mm-hmm. starts to be a problem as well. You start messing up the timeline and stuff like that. But everyone's doing pre- prequels like Game of Thrones. Like, There's just tons of prequels coming out. House so. of the Dragon, yeah. Yeah, so um, just stop it. Hollywood, just go forward, okay? Just take a risk. You don't want to take risks, but take a risk. <clears throat> well, to, to be fair, 
it's not like they're telling the same stories over again per se. They're actually exploring a few years that uh, that haven't been mined before, sort of that have been opened up by the introduction of Captain Pike into Star Trek Discovery, who was a fan favorite, and a lot of people were clamoring for sure. a series starring Anson Mount as Captain Pike. And then we've got uh, f- other familiar characters such as Spock and Uhura and number one, in well, addition to of- some additional uh, new uh, new characters. So it does look promising. And like the, 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 the thing that you kind of uh, alluded to is that we kind of know already how it ends for Pike. Yes. So it's a question of what is he going to do between now, you know, the, the beginning of the series and whenever things well, end for his story. And, and that, that is the, 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 the ride that we're going along for here. And that's my point, though. And I don't get me wrong. I'm excited. I even like the prequel Star Wars, which I'm sure is a huge controversial subject because I enjoy people are starting world. to appreciate them now more based on. Yeah, <laughs> I enjoy the world. I enjoy yeah. good sci fi. It was they're all well produced. I'm looking very much forward to this. My only point is that. We do know Pike's story. We do know Spock's story. We know that there is no risk if they get in bad situations. And also part of the problem when you're dealing with things where the, you know what happened ahead of it and you know what happened behind it is you're going to bump into things if you're not careful. It's a lot more wide open and you can tell new stories and let it go in a new direction when you go in the future and there's nothing to bump into. So that's that's my point with prequels just in general. It's not just about Star Trek, Star Wars, The Hobbit, everything. So um, that, that's the... Yeah, well, we have the new Lord of the Rings related yes. s- series of, on yeah. Amazon this this fall, which is like loosely based on the Cimmerillion. Uh, and Terminator. <laughs> there was that Terminator debacle. Like there's, there's all sorts of things that they start going back in time and you start ruining it like and it's just such a natural thing because hey we don't want to try to write new characters that's hard let's go back and retread ground <laughs> so that's that that's my complaint about it in general now i still watch it so yeah, i'm yeah. part of the problem yeah. but okay. i'm just saying i wish they would stop with the going back go forward well we've known for decades now that hollywood is out of ideas so yes it's it, that's why it's so interesting and unique when something just pops out of nowhere like the yeah. last year's academy award winner uh parasite for example yes. or even this year's academy award winner for best picture uh, coda uh you know children of deaf adults which i think we talked about last week so well, there is still room for new ip but just some of these aren't necessarily hunger uh, blockbuster games. franchises yeah. well what was that korean thing that just came out this year that everyone uh, everything ever, any uh, everything everywhere all at once and i'm looking for no no the tv oh, no. show then oh sorry squid game Squid Games. Yeah. People were obsessed with Squid Games. It's yeah. new. So it's like, wow, this is an interesting story. It's brand new. Mm-hmm. It's like, right, new stuff. <laughs> Tasia, what's your take on prequels? Are you for or against? Do you have any that you can think of that that you really appreciated or that or were really disappointed by? I don't really have any I can think of off the top of my head. But generally, like I understand Will's point. I'm very Even much Even though he's like, wrong? I'm very much like leave well enough alone. Yes. Like I don't I don't want to ruin something or the idea of something with either a prequel or a sequel. Like sometimes they should just stop. Mhm. And on a high note. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. You know what I mean? Well, I mean that's there have been legions of again, largely middle-aged white men decrying the uh, the ruining of their childhood by Raiders of the Lost Ark sequ- or Indiana Jones sequels, uh, Ghostbusters reboots and and whatnot. And, you know, in some cases, yeah, they've been <laughs> bad. Some cases, not so bad. Even the recent, you know, Star Trek series that we've talked about, you know, Discovery and Picard and Lower Decks, there there's a lot of mixed opinions on there. And, some, and even, like, of course, the, the Star Wars movies, the prequels, and the, the sequels, like it's hard when you are treading on ground, hallowed ground from people's <laughs> cherished childhood memories. And if you don't, you know, get things exactly how <laughs> legions of fans have it imagined in their own heads, like, I mean, that's, it's virtually an impossible task. But, you know, there are some, you know, some, some executed better than others. 
looking at the more recent Star Wars movies, for example, initially when The Force Awakens came out, a lot of people were really excited about it. But then when The the Last Jedi and then Rise of Skywalker came in, people started viewing The Force Awakens a little bit more critically as well. And, and Solo, didn't it was, it was a bit of a flop. But most people contend that Rogue One was the strongest of those yes. five me uh, movies, and I, I'm one of those. I thought Force Awakens wasn't terrible. Maybe it's the second yes. best out of, out of those five, but I agree. So it is, it is doable, but it's just really hard, especially in a modern landscape with you know can, evolving values, and you know, and then there's things around representation and stuff like I that, which some people can get a little one example, agitated about. Yes, what, one example the other way. What's that? Back to the Future. So one of not, the most treasured, touch that. Yeah. treasured, well-regarded, people are still obsessed. I follow Instagram mm -hmm. accounts that talk about it. Collectibles are super expensive. Try to buy a die-cast uh, toy of a, of a DeLorean. They're super expensive. DeLoreans are these crappy old cars that people love and collect and spend tens of money, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars on just because of that movie. It's a very beloved franchise. They did three and they were done they had a kids tv show in like the 90s which isn't really canon and like a comic book 20 years ago and that's it they've and never it, made any more books or movie or tv series or anything like and that. a kick-ass 2015 new year's party yes that's true that's true but i mean i still hold that <laughs> as a classic you know and they they're just like we are done it's yep. over and it, we told the story people like it and it's up there on the shelf. You can always watch it. I could, and it's classic. And I can still watch it now, and I love it. So, yeah, there's something to be said for, for not messing with it. But yes. you know, give give things enough time, and Hollywood just can't resist. Yeah. Right? So, um, uh, I I heard rumblings that they're they're thinking of revisiting Back to the Future, and I'm not sure if that was real or not. But you mentioned DeLorean. There's a story that I saw that I was al almost included today, but you know, there's another dozen stories are already cut. <laughs> so we may revisit it when it becomes more real in the, in the summer. But there is a new DeLorean being uh, released, an all electric one that. with a, a slick new design, and hopefully will be a much better car than the terrible car that the DeLorean actually was. Yeah. Unless, of course, you had the time machine version. Yes. So uh, speaking of our childhoods, Will, your pick of the week treads some old territory. Mr. Yeah. So uh, my wife has literally been waiting two years for this game to be released. It got delayed because of the pandemic. And uh, what we're game huge. is that? Uh, it is Lego Star Wars. This, the Skywalker saga. They've made many Lego Star Wars games. They've made, made many Lego games. Uh, for example, uh, Harry Potter, um, Indiana Jones, Batman. Uh, Batman. Um, we're big fans of them. They're kind of puzzle action, um, friendly, funny um, games. Uh, super about collecting stuff and solving puzzles. Um, we're huge fans, and we were waiting for this one for a while. It's finally all nine movies put together. Uh, we bought the collector's edition uh, with the uh, exclusive minifigure of Luke drinking blue milk. <laughs> He's um, even got the blue around his mouth. He's got blue around his face. How come um, they don't have the the animal from which he <laughs> <laughs> milked it. Yeah, um, milk. that was, yeah, that was, uh, that was gross. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I believe my wife is playing it as we speak. Um, she's been playing it most of the day and uh, she's a huge fan. She loves puzzle games. As you know, Tristan, she can kill many people at Tetris. She is a puzzle game aficionado. You had to bring that up. Yes. When we go to the arcade next, she's not invited. <laughs> yes. She torched you. Um, but anyways, so uh, she loves puzzle games. This is, she's literally been waiting two, two years for this to come out. And uh, I thought I was going to buy it for her birthday like mm -hmm. last year. And it, it took a whole another year for it to come out. And there's a special feature in the packaging. Yes. So this is, this is the outer cover. And you put it down and it puts That's the cool. helmet on Darth Vader. That's cool. <laughs> So that's what you get for another extra five bucks or whatever it was. <laughs> that, that and the minifig. 
Look, now you've, you've converted Tasia. She's now going to be a gamer. Now that she's that was that pretty cool. Tasia, is there any any games that you and your hubby uh, play together? Not a one. I'm not a ga- I, I'm not a gamer. Neither is neither is Stephanie. But we we have managed to find a couple of games to bring us closer together. No, we especially just now binge. with the PS Five. You just which? We just binge shows. You just force him to watch The Bachelorette. No, I don't watch that show. I've never the seen an episode. Bachelor in Paradise. Never seen an episode. I swear. I, I thought you who I thought you were our official reality TV correspondent. Come on. Well, I'm more like um, Love Is Blind. Oh right. Married at first sight. Oh yeah. Oh, so you go for the highbrow stuff. Really, I go for the, you know. Okay. Well, you've got a highbrow pick for us this Nailed week. It. Okay, I do. This one is a great show. I'm very excited we got to watch it because what's it called? It's called Last One Laugh in Canada. LOL. And I literally thought it mm-hmm. was only on Amazon Prime in Canada. Like I didn't realize. And then weeks after it came out, I was like, I'm just gonna look it up here. And duh, it's an Amazon Prime original, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I have it here as well. Nice. Um, it has a okay. So the host is Jay Baruchel. Who, who doesn't love oh, Jay yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And um, the premise is there's a bunch of comedians in a room together and they are not allowed to laugh. So the whole show is them trying to make each other laugh, but if they laugh, they're out. That's the whole premise of the show. And then whoever wins, so the last one laughing, they win money for their charity. So it's got Tom Green, which is the reason why nice. I mm. tried to find the show. So like I followed him online and I saw him like, you know, posting on Instagram and tweeting about it. And I was like, oh man, Canada, like, I don't get the show. Like, stupidly not thinking. Then weeks later, I was like, I'm just going to look it up. So it's like Tom Green, Colin Mockery, Caroline Ray. Like, there's just, there's so many iconic Canadian comedians, plus Jay Baruchel. And honestly, I did not think it would be as funny as it was. Like, I thought it would be like a little weird or like, you know, sometimes Canadian programming is a little kooky. And it is. Yes. It is, but like in the best way. And we were cracking up every episode. It, oh, Dave it Foley, honestly, yeah. uh-huh. yes, Dave Foley, yes, like iconic comedian from Kids in the Hall. Yeah, seriously. So oh, that's it, the guy from Whose Line so, Is It so Anyway? Good. Yeah, D- Colin Mockery was. Yeah, uh, Colin Mockery. Yeah, and he actually was at uh, Vancouver Theater Sports League way back in the day. I remember seeing him like in the eighties, I think. Oh wow! Oh yeah, like yeah. these are heavy hitters in this room and like some of my i think the reason this works is i mean obviously for us canadians in the room um it's nostalgia seeing some of your favorite comedians Mm -hmm. but like you know brett's not canadian so he was like who are these and he still thought it was so (laughs) hilarious i mean he knows who tom green is he knows jay barish you know there's a few but like um i think because one of my favorite things in the world is watching people break or try not to break. Mm-hmm. To me, it's as good as somebody falling. So like you're, that to me, you're sadistic, is, just, is what you're saying. Yes, it is so good. So I, it's a strong, strong recommendation. You will not be disappointed. Nice, nice. Um, so, do you follow Tom Green's YouTube channel, Tasia? I do. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's definite recommend. He, he was. It was interesting when during the early days of the lockdown, and he was in his place in in Los Angeles, and mm-hmm. he was playing a lot of piano, and he was doing some live streams, doing some it's amazing, yeah, you know, making beats and all this, all all that kind of thing. And it was sometimes it was just, it would just be he'd go on for a couple of hours and just yeah. sometimes doing Q and A, and then he decided to. Uh, so almost, it was almost like he was hopping on a trend. He got, he tricked out a van and then went and took his, uh, dog and went into the desert. <laughs> and, uh, yep. that was, uh, that was kind of a, a neat chapter in, in that, uh, in that story. And then he went, uh, and then he moved back to Canada to Ontario. Looks like semi-rural. He's got, looks like he's got acreage with a barn and, yep. and that's a whole thing now. So it's, it's been neat to watch as, you know, I've been following him since the, since the '90s, with his uh, original mm-hmm. uh, talk show, that Trailblazer. Was, yeah, it was on um, what you call it, uh, Comedy Cent- or no, the Comedy Network. But after after it was originally on Rogers Cable, like the local access yes. cable show, 
which was um who was that talk show host who was like so famous for like five years who's canadian talk show host and he went on there and he had like a a dead raccoon in a suitcase yeah, and he yeah cut that's it tom open. green that's tom green no no the the oh. host of the show was like oh do you oh, remember yeah. that was it was it um Mike, what's his face? Like, yes, kind of Mike Bullard. Show. Mike Bullard, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so Tom Green went on there. Yeah, oh. and he made Mike Bullard vomit. Because <laughs> he cut a dead raccoon in half. Right. Classic Iconic. Comedy. Yes. He was, Living he legend. Started, he is. He started a genre. Yes. Well, he was Jackass before Jackass, right? Like, that's what he used He's to do. He's the was original. That like, his pranks, though. But the thing with him... Like, Jackass was so lowbrow to me, and, like, okay, it's just people hurting themselves. Like, like It did have its moments, like, especially when you're watching thing, it with buddies or something. Like, it's, yeah. it's just, just sitting there watching on your own, it's like, this is stupid. But when you're yeah. with, the, with the few people, and you just kind of get into it, and just like in the original movie, where one of them has a Hot Wheels car up their rear end and they go to the doctor to see about it and just like the, the doctor's reaction i mean just it sounds off disgusting which it is obviously but it was also kind of funny but i get i get what you're you're saying it's not it's like tom green is an artist right he's tom an ab green absurdist comedy yeah the slut mobile <laughs> airbrushing I mean? air, yeah, airbrushing Need his I parents car, his dad's car yeah brilliant the classic 90s so, the one that i so the one that I remember that I think illustrates your point is he went into the National Gallery in Ottawa and smuggled in his own painting and put it on a blank wall and was showing people, what do you think of this painting? And uh, and they were like, well, whatever. Oh, yeah. He's like, what if I put a tree here? And he, he like put a, a, yeah. a pen and started drawing a tree and he got thrown out of the art <laughs> gallery for defacing a painting he brought in. <laughs> Come on! Yeah, yeah. and he's like, the best part is they're gonna pay to restore that. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, raccoons that are largely intact, as far as we know, you may have noticed on Instagram. Uh, I hate to uh, to my own horn here, or yes. guess, but uh, we were sitting watching TV a couple of nights ago, and it's like scritchy scratch, scritchy scratch. What's going on? It sounds like it's coming from the roof. Went out to into the sunroom and then looked at the door out to the deck and then up where it was pouring rain out. But there's this little part along the edge of our roof that's covered by the other portion portion of the roof and snapped a photo of this little guy. Oh, oh that was great. <laughs> and it's just that, I mean, you see the creepy little fingers too. Like that's why those trash pandas are, are very strange yeah. and weird. But um it was it was a neat little moment. We had a little we had a little connection. We were just staring at each other for a while. Um, I kind of wanted to just like help him down because it looked like he was trying to get down, but I just didn't want to touch him either. So, because no. you know, you shouldn't really interact with wild animals if you can help it. But yeah, anyhow, they carry do... diseases and they're quite vicious. Mm, they're yes, cutie little patooties. Don't be <laughs> cute, fooled. Cutie patootie. So my pick of the week was actually from uh, a couple weeks ago, but got uh, bumped by some other things. And I know we've t we have talked about this in the past and I didn't want to rub it in Will's nose too much because I know he wanted to come for this and wasn't able to for some scheduling reasons. Oh. And, uh, but highly recommend the Robert Pattinson. Uh, I need to oh, watch it. So good. Of the Batman. I need to oh watch gosh. it. Me too. It's, you know, fair warning. It's three hours long. Movies. It's three hours long. Well, cool. say the say, say say the word well, and you know, as soon as would you go again? I know that you're waiting. You're waiting for some stuff. I I, I maybe, but there's also Morbius is is uh. coming out as well. So we've oh, got yeah, some catch. Yeah. But I might uh, I could be convinced or or treated to see this. Um, sure, but it's I'll treat you. It's very grounded. It's fine. Um, it's not entirely unlike the Christopher Nolan. Um, mm -hmm. Batman trilogy, maybe somewhat less fantastical. I I heard this described, and forgive me if I already mentioned this, that he, his this is year two of Batman's career and where he's basically just a weirdo who goes out at night and punches people. Mm -hmm. And then somehow shows up in police investigations and it's perfectly normal, although some of the cops are like, who is this guy who's showing up in a bat outfit? And proto-Commissioner Gordon, before he was actually commissioner, 
has a relation, you know, has an understanding with Batman and trusts him. So it's well, and the the depiction by Paul Dano of the Riddler is unlike any depiction of the Riddler we've you know, seen in film before. It's it's quite wild and it's very modern, still quite dark. It's shot. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's very. I'll, I, I describe it. It's very dark and wet. You can, you can even by the trailer here, you can see how how dark it is, and mm-hmm. it seems like it's raining all the time in Gotham because Gotham is just that kind of place where it's just riddled with crime and and corruption. But I just, I you know, I, we were in the the VIP uh, theater, uh, Cineplex at Brentwood, and just you know, you could lean the seats back, not too far back, so you don't mm-hmm. want to fall asleep, but just just soaked it in, let it wash over me with all that rain. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, well, there Not, was... But, you know, I don't want to raise expectations. So. Just, yeah. But Robert Pattinson, a lot of people were, when he was announced as going to be the Batman, people were like, what, really? But if you've seen some of his other non great work, you would understand, right? Yeah. He's great. Yeah. There is um, a series of books, um, obviously, Dark Knight, and these are one-off books, but there's also mm-hmm. Year One, um, and I've mm-hmm. read a couple of them, and Year Two. So mm-hmm. some, I don't know if some of that is playing off those uh, yes. classic books but yes uh, indeed but exploring different parts of of batman's origin and and growing up as the batman speaking of origin will scratch genesis yes project for this week boss level beats yes this Tell was us about it a huge project uh it took me a long time um Organized 23 other humans, um, which uh, oh. can't really go into it, but there's there's all sorts of things that happen when you try to give 23 people instructions. It's like herding cats, right? It's like herding cats, but honestly, people were awesome. Um, they were really into it and brought some really good um, music. I'm so thrilled, and all of them were nice, but there's always little hiccups here and there with any kind of big project, So and, and people were really understanding and... And helpful as well. So I, I really enjoyed the project. Um, it I learned a ton. I've never really done a lot of mastering before. So that was actually one of the things I'm talking about is that the biggest challenge was just mastering um, different tracks. Uh, so it's just hard when you bring that many people together, you'll have different volumes and kind of normalize things different. A bit. Yeah, different bass and, and high end and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, the, those huge things that I've learned and people were really understanding with that and and people seem to love the graphic. I've had a lot of feedback on on this graphic. I'm a one man show, so I organized, I made some beats, I made the graphic, um, I did all that stuff and, and uh, I'm really happy with the way it worked out. And I see that now that Genesis is in reference to Sega Genesis, you've got that whole box yeah. art design from as a Sega Genesis game. Super. And it's original super box cool. art. This is yeah. like some of the original yeah. box art for Genesis. There's, I, I had to research it and study. There's different box art depending on what year games came out. Um, this is one of the first iterations. Wow. Um, there's more of just a square uh, is the original, mm-hmm. uh, but I wanted to add the little thing at the bottom. The nook. I don't know what you call That's it. So the, cool. the notch. <laughs> yeah. So um, well, Sega was ahead of the game with the notch. I take with that the out. Notch. <laughs> Bottom yeah. notch. So uh, so yeah, I'm super thrilled with it, and uh, it's on Table Beats right now app, um, and I'm going to be uploading it to tablist.net soon, so it'll be online as well within awesome. the week, I think. So, so features Bean One archive artwork, C4 Dan One. DJ Boston Crab with a K, DJ DSK, DJ Mike, AKA Misionero, DJ Rasp, DJ Sue, DJ T-Cut, DJ Wish, DJ, uh, Dragon Function, El Hundo, Lil Back, Mike MSA, Richie Roughtone, Rock Daddy, Sir Skulls, Scratch Street, Stunts One, and of course, Molotov. Yes, the other thing I'd like to point out, you mentioned DJ Mike, he's from Italy, some of them are from England, some of them are from the USA. Mm-hmm. Some of them are from Canada. One of the challenges that I'm talking about, I would get messages at three o'clock in the morning, um, uh, things like that. So, but it, it's amazing to bring the community together. So I was so a happy to do this. International awesome. fair. Well done. And a great learning experience too, it sounds like. Yes. Oh, Teja. Let me guess if it's a if it's a, if it's a week on the calendar, you probably have a video on yes. YouTube. So what's this? She kills it. About? That's correct. I do every single week. Um, this one, I believe, was back tips for productivity. 
Yes, it was perfect. Um, <laughs> MacBook tips specifically, or, or was that just for SEO? Mind. Can can I just yes, say something SEO. first of all, Tasia, you are an inspiration as someone who creates stuff and and I spend a lot of time creating things. I don't do what you do, but I find your work ethic and consistency truly inspirational. Oh my gosh! Well, thank you. This will motivate me to keep going. When I had days like today, where I was like. Oh. I was shooting in bulk today. I just kept screwing up. Like it took me so long to get a sentence out. And I was like, okay. Pain, pain, pain is hard to work through pain. Yeah, It is. Like I was like, so just already distracted. You know, you're already like irritable cause you're mm -hmm. sore. And, but anyway, I, thank you Will because that <laughs> would keep me going. But yeah, so this one was MacBook tips for productivity. So I'm just sharing a few that um, I think will help save time in your day. So any, any time you can do one less click in any functionality to me is a big one. So I talk a little bit about, you know, opening things with default apps. I talk a little bit about a couple keyboard shortcuts, like using the option key for a few things in Finder. I don't want to give too much away, but there's, there's a lot of little nuggets in there. Yeah, the option key is is one of those things. Like I even I've been using a Mac for a long, long time, and I forget half the time. It's like, oh, yeah. how come there's not? Yeah, you, you can't see that. Even like clicking on some of the things in the menu bar. If you hold the option key down while clicking the Wi-Fi menu or the Bluetooth menu, there's all sorts of other things that appear. And then some of the other you know, in the contextual menus when you right click or control click in the Finder and other apps. If you hold down Option, sometimes a whole bunch of other stuff appears. So that was really cool that you mentioned that default apps was great. I really appreciated the Hot Corners one. I've been a big fan of hot corners for a long long time so that's uh, the first thing legitimately <clears throat> anytime i you know from the very first black macbook i had way back in the day which, which gave which, your way which i have in your right now in the museum the retro Beautiful. museum opening don't someday. ever get rid of it because it's a perfect you know spot in time but yeah. um for literally the first thing i set up it it's funny to me that they drive some people crazy, but to me, yeah. it's such functionality that like, I know which corner is which for yep. me and blammo, I'm out in my day or blammo, there's my screensaver. And it's just mm, chef's kiss. Yeah. And it takes, and it takes advantage of a phenomenon known as Fitz law where, and that's the same reason why Apple still maintains the menu bar at the top of the screen, as opposed to having menu bars in each individual window, like windows does, because what you can do is like, no matter how far, up, you throw the the mouse pointer. It's always going to stop at the top, and then you can yeah. you then you can go to your uh, your horizontal options there. Similar with the hot corners, you just fling the mouse to that corner, and it doesn't matter if you overshoot because it's going to stop in the corner and activate yeah. that. So if people are a little enthusiastic with their mousing, they can accidentally trigger the hot corners, and if it activates mission control or the screensaver or whatnot, it can catch them off guard, especially when you have someone using your computer who's not used to that. Yeah. But once you get used to those those features of the shortcuts, you can't live without them, right? Because they're so no. handy for, you know, especially if you've got lots of you know, windows open in a given application or all the windows, you can have mission control or just reveal the um, windows from your uh, your frontmost application, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, activate screensaver, disable screensaver. So no, it's, that's it's, we appreciate that you're like Prometheus bringing, bringing fire to humankind. You know, you're yes. bringing these yes. Mac tips to the world. So Will, watch this video if you haven't already. It's yes. also helpful for people. You talk about <laughs> secondary devices or like someone else using your computer. But like, for example, if I go into my client's office, they've got a Mac set up there for me, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing I did when I logged into that Mac was create my hot corners. And they are exactly what I have at home. Mm -hmm. So now it's just you get in that mental space of like, yep, I'm familiar with this. This Ooh, is my computer. Yeah. Like I just, I just know the usability and I'm so used to these gestures mm -hmm. and that can be really helpful for people if people find themselves switching between devices. Totally. Mama loves her hot corners. Love them. Nice. If you like other hot things, you can find out more about us at momentous.tv, facebook.com slash momentous TV, twitter.com slash momentous TV, where there may be an edit button someday if you subscribe and pay for Twitter Blue, instagram.com slash momentous.tv on YouTube. You can go to twitter. Sorry, youtube.com slash TJM Jutra, or you can search my name and look for the momentous playlists that are there. Of course, uh, Will's projects can be found on 
tablebeats.com, the Tablist app for iOS. Is it on Android yet? I, yeah. I probably ask you every time. Yeah, yeah. Great. And of course, willsilver.com and Tasia, your work at youtube.com slash Tasia Custody or TasiaCustody.com. We're looking forward to another podcast episode sometime soon as well. So, you know, add it to minute. the list. I know. <laughs> once, you've, once you've got your pain management under control. I know. But uh, it was great to have you back, Tasia. We're sorry we didn't, uh, that Gray wasn't able to join in this week. Maybe next week it'll be the four of us again. It seems so special when it is. Yes. <laughs> I think it's a conspiracy between the three of you to like, to just keep me on my toes, honestly, like, and to really appreciate when everyone is here together. So it's like, you know, don't, don't, don't let Tristan get complacent. You know, we got to. I've missed two episodes. <laughs> no, you've been and great. And one of them I had surgery. <laughs> yes. Well, Will, Tasia, anyone else out there in the strange new worlds, we hope your week is truly momentous. Wow.